Hello and welcome to another episode of The Genius Podcast. My name is Karen Doyle, your host and founder of The Genius Project, an initiative for Catholic women designed to support them towards growth in all areas of life, be that professional, spiritual or personal. Now, we seek to do this through our online courses and resources, The Genius Podcast, our online virtual events and the Catholic Women's Masterclass. Now, the Catholic Women's Masterclass is a four-month journey of transformation and really it's a transformational journey towards wholeness and balance in Christ. So we have two groups that have just kicked off last week. Those groups are full so I have opened up a third group for women. This this masterclass honestly ladies it is really changing people's lives. It's changing people's marriages. It's changing people's perception of themselves, what they do, their confidence and just their experience of living life. So the invitation is yours, ladies. Please come and join us. Check it out. And I look forward to journeying with you. Today's Genius Podcast guest is Megan Kozak. Megan is the co-founder of Lighthouse Relationship Psychology and Counseling. Her passion is helping walk alongside people to develop relationship skills that are going to see them living relationships that are whole and healthy. Her passion is preparing couples for marriage, walking with couples after marriage, and then doing relationship education and strategy sessions for people in the workplace. She brings a wealth of experience and knowledge to the table in this area, and I really hope and pray that you get a lot from this interview. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Megan Kozak. Well, welcome, Megan, to the Genius Podcast. It's lovely to have you. We've been chasing this interview for a while, but it's great to have you here and welcome all the way from Queensland. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to see you. Yes. Well, you're up there in the north and I don't think you're really that affected by all these lockdowns, are you? Been so We're blessed. so lucky. We've had a couple of snap lockdowns and, you know, we've been grumbling about three days, whereas you guys are in there for the hundreds of days. So we're feeling very blessed. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. My family's all, all up on the Sunshine Coast, so we are just emerging from lockdown at the moment. Kids are going back to school slowly before Christmas. Oh, yeah. good. That's, there's hope. There's hope in the horizon. That's right. Fingers crossed. But look, Megan, it's great to have you with us. And today we're going to deep dive into looking at, I guess, how to have healthy relationships, how we can navigate some of those challenges. Because I know I'm hearing from a lot of women, lockdown kind of, it's like a pressure cooker, really. You're kind of all home together. All those issues, the stress, the chaos, it just is a pressure cooker and a recipe for disaster, really, in terms of intimate relationships. But relationships with kids or friends or in the workplace and so today we're going to talk about and unpack I guess some skills and tools that people can have to help them navigate that and I think that is especially helpful coming out of lockdown I know half of Australia is in lockdown half is not but regardless of where we find ourselves we all need these tools don't we absolutely definitely Well, look, Megan, I'd love you to tell and share a little bit about yourself, your journey and what you do, if you don't mind. Sure, I'd love to. Thank you. Uh, I am 36. I'm a mum of two, a wife of one. All is going well. It's just lovely. We, um, I am the co-founder and director of a psychology and counselling practice called Lighthouse Relationships, which is in Brisbane. Uh, this is sort of a new direction for me and for us. My husband is a psychologist and has been for a number of years, um, but I'm not. So I'm a relationship educator and a couples counsellor. But prior to that, I was just an educator and I worked in a whole variety of different areas, including juvenile detention, Catholic education, the state system, and saw a whole lot of different work. And it was always to do with identity, pastoral care, communication and conflict. And so I loved it going through all of that. But I got to a point where I was working in executive leadership for a number of years where I was just exhausted. And I needed to make some really big decisions for myself and also for my children. I have two little girls who are six and eight now, and they were younger at the time. And so I decided I needed to really make some changes and do some reflecting. And each year, and I think I've heard you say this too, Karen, this might resonate with you, but each year I have a word that is my focus Uh for the year. 
Yeah. And I've been doing this for about 15 years. And so sometimes it's flourish or thrive or whatever it is. And I remember sitting down and journaling with God and going, gosh, what's my word going to be for the start of this year? And I was just going, okay. And the words that came up were revive, repurpose, repair, uh, reimagine, redirect, reprioritize. And I was like, well, God, they're very nice, but it's not one. Could you just give me one maybe? Okay. And the through line there was re. And so I did some investigating into this and it comes from this beautiful Latin prefix, which means again. And so I thought, oh, it's this two-letter permission slip to go again, to start again and try again. And so that's what I did a couple of years ago. I retrained and I repurposed my skills and we rebuilt, (coughs) excuse me, we rebuilt and created this process and this organisation called Lighthouse. And um, it's just been wonderful and it has grown so quickly and is doing so well and there's such a need for it at the moment. Absolutely. we're loving it. Yeah, praise God. And there is such a need. I know when we run our sisterhood conferences, you know, one of the big issues that I see is a lot of women whose husbands, boyfriends, dads have been impacted by pornography and the fallout yes. that that has. And so I've walked pastorally with many, many women over the years and we've developed a program for women in that kind of betrayal trauma area. But one thing I haven't been able to access is, you know, we'd send them off or they'd see counsellors and psychologists who totally miss the mark. And so what I love about what you're doing is you're just hitting the nail on the head. And I'm so thrilled because, you know, I can send people to you now that, you know, it's it's great for me to walk with them pastorally. But, you know, when people in trauma or when they're in like, you know, say in a marriage that's really hit that critical point, they actually need professional help and they need people to walk alongside them because it's not so much, you know, go to confession or just pray more or just be more positive. We actually lack tools. We lack the skills because to have a healthy relationship, you have to know how to do that, correct? Absolutely. you do so well. Yes. Oh, and you know, that's what I love because they are learnable skills. They are teachable, learnable, accessible skills. It's not like it's a magic thing that someone's born with and someone's not. And I think one of the gifts that have come out of COVID is that mental health and relationship support have come out of the shadows. Mm -hmm. So both of those things are no longer something that we need to quietly manage on our own. We've discovered that actually professional support in these spaces are incredibly valuable and incredibly important and accessible for people across Australia. So we now work with people, obviously in Brisbane face-to-face, but we work with people in WA and Victoria and New South Wales, even New Zealand. So it's really important to make those connections, as you say. Yeah, well, look, I'm plug- I'm going to be plugging your services far and wide because I think I have seen the fallout from when it's done poorly and it's yes. just I'm so thrilled to connect with you and to be able to introduce you to all the women in my community because, like you said, sometimes we don't have to hit that critical point where there's trauma and where things are falling yes. apart. I like, you know, the prophylactic response where let's go upstream, let's go way back oh. before we're drowning yes. and let's intervene here. Like let's, as you do, like you do do marriage preparation, but yeah. let's even when we're single, use that season to prepare yes. ourselves and whether that's for marriage or not, it could be religious life, the workplace. There are tools and skills that all of us need to know. And we go through school. I watch my children go through school and, you know, they're just not educated for life. They're not mm. educated for life. They're, you know, there's the curriculum, but this learning that has to happen, it doesn't matter what your academic IQ is. You know, the research shows that our success, our happiness, our joy in life comes really from EQ, from emotional intelligence. Oh, absolutely. I could not agree with you more, definitely. And the sooner you learn them and the more that you learn them, the, yes. the more set up you are. And the, the beauty of working with couples is you're not just working with two people. You're actually having this incredible impact on a family of origin. So these yes. skills that you're teaching to these people are then going to be reflected and taught and modelled for their children and their children's children and the couples that they associate with. Because yes. what we we are the people who we are with more than more than we are not. So it's such a valuable gift to have. Absolutely. And, you know, a core part of that is, I guess, we we come, and let's use marriage as an example, but it can be across any area of life, but we come to a particular situation and it's not just who we are, but we have from our family of origin, the way we've been wired, the temperament God's given us. Yes. And so many people just don't understand this. It's not so much this personal development as it is this self-knowledge. Like, 
I, I really want to see more people get to know who they are, their temperament, yes. the way they're wired, because when people understand who they are, then they can learn how to interact with others because our relationships dynamics come out of, you know, this God given yes. self and gift that we've been given. Absolutely. And whether we know it or not, whether we're aware of it consciously or not, we bring that with us into every relationship that we have as good or bad. And so sometimes we need to do some excavation work to uncover, well, who is that person? It's not like finding yourself in an old pair of jeans or it's not like kind of creating yourself in a new way. It's already there. The gift that you have, the temperament you've been given is at your core already. Your beautiful and difficult sometimes job is to unpack and uncover that. And so sometimes I like to use the analogy, you know, those beautiful ornate Russian dolls that yeah. are kind of layered on top yeah. of one another. So on the outside, you might be, I am, you know, often we relate to ourselves in terms of our relationships. So I introduced myself as a mother, a wife, a daughter, you know, and that might be our outside layer. But as you go underneath that, actually, I'm a lover of Christmas and I'm a chocoholic. And then if you go down a little bit further, I'm a teacher and an educator and a counsellor and a transformer. You know, as you go further and further, you discover who you are and the gifts that you have. And when you know them and you can own them, you bring them into a relationship regardless of who that's with. Mm, I love that analogy. I used to love those dolls. My cousin had one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I never had one, but I, I love that. It's so good. I'm such a visual person and I love that visual of peeling back the layers to discover who we are. And, I, you know, I do a lot of speaking pre-COVID and uh, I would speak at the men's conference and be talking to the men about how to understand women and how to have better relationships with them. And we always began with this idea of who are you? Like you have to know who you are. And I think so often, especially with young men, they go into relationships looking to the woman to answer the question of who you are. And, yes. and women can do the same equally. And I think that is where the start of a lot of relationship issues begin because we're actually going to the other to take something that they, that other person is not capable of giving, nor should they. And so, Definitely. yeah, it's about coming back and really understanding who we are as daughters and sons of God, how we're wired and then entering into relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I love this quote. John Paul II talks about life being co-educative. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but he says, you know, men and women educating one another about who she will be for him, who he will be for her and learning to come alongside one another. And I think as we go into this podcast episode and, and really unpack some tools and skills, I would like to base it and ground it in that scripture, you know, from Matthew 19 and John 4, 2 talks about this theology of the body that in the beginning, it wasn't so that God's original plan for us was not this conflict and antagonism and the battle of the sexes, but a relationship of complementarity and and whether that is in intimate relationships or not we're just we're called to come alongside one another as a gift but my experience in relationship education has been that so many people don't know how to do the coming alongside and that's where yes. we, we want to go today so oh wonderful i love it all right Great. so megan take us deeper take us deeper into this idea that how do we come alongside each other in relationships yeah, gosh, it's such an important question. And we do, whenever we're in relationship with someone, it's like we're these two rough stones and we, we knock up against one another and rub up against one another. And that's wonderful because slowly we smooth one another out, which is great, but it can be a really painful process if you don't know how to do that with kindness and grace and skills. Yeah. One of the first things I tell couples when they come into my office, because often they're quite nervous, you know, that might be the first time they've decided to open up about their relationship. And also the research tells us that the average couple waits six years before they seek help, which is, is extraordinary. Right? Yes. Six years. Wow. six years is the average before they seek help. Could you imagine if we did that with a toothache or with a noise mm -hmm. in our car or any other part of our life? It'd be like, oh, it'll be fine. It would be. That's exactly right. Yeah. So that's our average, which means some couples obviously come in earlier, but some couples come in even later than that, which is really tricky. Yeah. So the first thing I tell couples is it's very rare that people come into this office just to tell me how wonderful things are going. Okay, don't worry. It's going to be fine. Let's lay it on the table and let's be honest. Let's be clear, kind, but let's be honest about what it is. Because we walk into relationships as broken people. We just are. I am. 
you look very lovely today, but I'm sure deep down mm-hmm. there's some areas, you know, of work, Absolutely. all of us are. And that's not, not just okay, that's actually wonderful because that's where the gifts of vulnerability lie. Mm-hmm. It's this beautiful moment of connection there. And what I need to remind myself often, and also my clients as well, and if they're Christian, I'll take it in this direction. And if they're not, I'll reframe it in a different way. But the people who walked before us, weren't perfect either. And I give them some examples. So let me read this to you. This is, it's anonymous. I wish I could attribute it to an author, but I just love it. It says, Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran away from God. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossiper. Martha was a nervous wreck. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was depressed. Moses stuttered. Zacchaeus was short. Abraham was old and Lazarus was dead. And God can use those people to do extraordinary things. And we still look to them thousands of years later. So God can use me and God can use you. Mm, I love That's that. That's the start. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're broken. Welcome to the club. Yeah. That's what Absolutely. God's for. He's not here as a haven for the perfect, but as a refuge for the broken. So let's start broken together. Amen. That's brilliant. I love that. We're going to have to put that up. And I have read it before, but so true. Dr. Greg Vitaro recently at the Catholic Women's Summit talked about this and that we often reject these parts of ourselves. But he's saying like our path to wholeness is actually to look at and hold it all, our struggle and our strength side by side and be grateful and acknowledge this is part of who I am. Yes. But, you know, that invitation that this is where the Lord's calling us to growth. And this is the thing that I see in relationships um, and the people that I walk with is so often they see the obstacle mm. as the irritation, but yes. it's actually the invitation and it's the invitation oh. to growth. And when we're approaching this from a, a Catholic, a Christian perspective, like we are on a road of beatitude. We're on a road of growing in virtue, of becoming the fullness of who Christ wants us to be. That means dying to self. It means, yeah. you know, the thorn in our side is the thing that keeps us dependent on Christ so that we can grow in our capacity to love. So beautiful. Yes. Oh, and I think we want to just be so desperately. We want to be heard and seen and known. Mm. We can't do that until we hear and see and know ourselves and we are vulnerable enough to let our partner or our friend or our family, whoever we're in relationship with, know and see and hear those parts of ourselves which we are not as proud of. Mm. And that is incredibly vulnerable and difficult to do, but it is only in those moments that you have that true vulnerability, intimacy and connection. It has such a gift and such value. Mm, Absolutely. And I, I think that's right. I used to see vulnerability. Well, I don't think I did, but I think there's this, just this cultural notion as weakness, but there's actually incredible strength. And, And I think we were touching on this before the podcast, but there's, when you're vulnerable, you give others permission to be vulnerable, to be real. And that's a gift. It really is. Let me give you an example. This is not one from a marriage. It's an example from women, okay? Okay. But it it works regardless of any circumstance. Mm. So I was off to do the shopping and I'd given myself half an hour of of time beforehand. I'd brought my journal. I sat down with my cup of tea and hid in this little cafe. And I thought, this is my moment. It is my gift. I love this. And I sat down and then about two minutes in, I heard the wail of a toddler. And as a mother, you just know it. You just know like, oh, this poor kid is tired, exhausted, frazzled, whatever it is. And it kept on going and going. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, this poor toddler and this poor woman or man who was with them. And after about, it would have been four or five minutes, I saw this woman come around and she ended up stopping about 10 metres in front of me. And she had this little boy who would have been maybe 18 months old. And another little girl who was slightly older, both in a pram in front of her, and she just stopped and her whole body sagged. And she picked up this little boy and it would have been for the hundredth time that morning. You know, you could see in Mm. that moment, it was just exhausting. And she cuddled him and hugged him and told him it was going to be fine. And her whole face just dropped in embarrassment and exhaustion. Mm. And in that moment, I was looking at her and just thinking, oh, my darling, I have walked where you have walked. I have been that person. I know that feeling. And I had two choices. I could leave her in that space of isolation and vulnerability, or I could follow this little embarrassing prompt to go and stand with her, to go and be with her in that moment of vulnerability. She didn't know me. I didn't know her. It was a bit of a risky move, but I thought, you know what? Okay. So I left my journal and I left my tea and I walked over and this lovely woman would have been maybe early thirties looked up at me quite embarrassed thinking I might have been like telling her off for interrupting my one quiet moment in my whole day 
And I just walked over and I put my hand on her arm and I just said, I just wanted to let you know you're doing a really good job. Oh, you made and me she made me want to cry. Just, oh, she just melted. Yes, she just oh. melted into tears. And then do you know what was beautiful? Two other women came and joined us. So a lady oh. left the service desk at Coles opposite the way, left her oh, service desk and came beautiful. over next to her. And this other woman wheeled over her trolley with a little boy in it. And the three of us just stood around her and enveloped her in that moment of vulnerability because so we'd walked where she'd walked. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so we find these moments in everyday life. And sometimes it's easier to do that with strangers than it is to do that with our own partner. Mm-hmm. We can have the grace or the guts to go and do that and to show kindness and to, to make someone's day. When it comes to our partner and they've left their socks on the floor for the 15th time that week, sometimes the grace There's is There's a bit of there. history there, right? That's right. <laughs> exactly. So we find different ways to, to be in that, those moments of vulnerability with our partner. Yes, absolutely. And I think what you you highlight there is just that it is easier sometimes to do this with strangers and this idea that there's a whole history and a whole story that involves and surrounds us in our intimate relationships and even family of origin, say with our mothers and fathers and our siblings, like we have a story. And I'd love you to speak into that for a moment. Just how do people, I guess, step out of that story and connect because what we're talking about is connection and we know that we're made in God's image so we're made for relationship and connection so the fact that we experience conflict or difficulty or irritation it's not God's plan like we're actually designed to have healthy fulfilling passionate beautiful connected relationships that is God's plan and design for us so if that's his plan and design And if there's these obstacles, how can we kind of overcome some of those or walk through them and grow through them to the other side to, I guess, God's plan for us? Have you got any thoughts how we can do that? Absolutely. And it's the question of the moment. Gosh, it really is. Because everybody, we we walk with our family of origin Mm. as a part of us, entrenched in us. We bring it with us wherever we go, for better or for worse. And we make choices around that. So often we choose to either model ourselves on what was done so we repeat it or we respond and rebel against it so depending on the experience that we had and sometimes in between so we might look through it and go well I'm definitely doing that but I'm never acting like this you know depending on what it was that we had and so our perception of normal is shaped by the people who we grew up with so however our parents communicated however they solved conflict the way in which family dinners happened or Christmas morning worked all of those things we perceive to be our normal. Then we meet this partner and we connect with them and we fall in love and it's magical and wonderful. And then suddenly our normals don't match. And we think, okay, hang on a second. Are you telling me it's not normal to scream across the kitchen at you in order to solve a problem? Like we just suddenly, we're really surprised because that was our normal. That's what we were taught, whether it was directly or indirectly, that's what we've taken on board. And so it's in those moments, and this is why I love pre-marriage work, actually, that you get to have a look at everything that your family of origin gave you, the gifts that they gave you, and also the things that they gave you that served a purpose for a time but is no longer needed because you're wanting to do something different. You Mari Kondo those part of your life. You hold them, you say thank you, you put them down and you keep walking, right? And so you create a new tradition together or a new way of working together. And that's incredibly important. Now, in terms of the tools in which you can use to do that, we've got to start with communication. It's really, really core because sometimes our parents have not modelled for us appropriate communication. And sometimes they may have tried as much as they can, but they just didn't have the skills for it or they hid it from us as a way to protect us. And so we may just not have learned it. So we start by looking at what's called uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Mm, That's an intense one, isn't it? Aren't they great? Go, God. Yes. Yes. He is hands down. Can I just say anybody who's struggling, who needs tools, who might not want to seek counselling yet, the seven principles for making marriage work by John Gottman. He, in all my years, 20 years of relationships education, he is the standout for me. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So Could please with run you. with that. And the four horsemen come from John Gottman, don't they? They do. They and, come from John and Julie Gottman. Yeah. Yes. And they That's talk right. about once these four horsemen march their way into your marriage or your relationship, that's when you're in big trouble. So the, the key is that's not right. to get there, but he has antidotes of when they're there, he does. what to do. That's so right. 
You Absolutely. For us. Yeah. yeah. So there's four and it's got a quite dramatic name. Like I remember reading it for the first time and going the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Oh my gosh, surely this is just like a way of talking. This can't be this yeah. bad, but they have really profound impacts on relationships. So it's appropriately dire in the way that they talk. Mm. So the first one is criticism. And so this is where we um, criticize our partner, which is not necessarily about an action, but it's about blaming our partner and often using their character as a way of blaming them. Yeah. So instead of saying, you left your socks on the floor, you'd say, you are so lazy, you left your socks on the floor again. Suddenly the criticism becomes personal attack and that's a real shift. Mm -hmm. So then the second one is contempt and contempt out of all four, contempt is the one that most clearly highlights the likelihood of separation or divorce because it is so insidious. Mm -hmm. So contempt can sometimes be verbal, but it can also be nonverbal. So this is where we communicate a sense of superiority over our partner or a real disdain for them. So it might be when they're speaking, we roll our eyes, we cross our arms, we walk away. It might be in front of other people, we make a joke at their expense. It's something to demonstrate that they are not as valuable or respected as we are in this relationship. It's a real mismatch of power. The third one then is defensiveness. And it kind of is what it sounds like. It's, it's where you put up a defensive wall. So someone might bring something to you in feedback, whether it's done well or poorly. Throw but it back at them. Exactly. I'm not taking it. It's not yes. me. It's all you. It's yeah, actually your right. fault. <laughs> exactly. It was never me. That's right. You just refuse yeah. to own anything. Mm. And then the final one is stonewalling. And I love this one because it sounds so visual. It's like you build a wall between you and your partner. And sometimes it's like a shutdown and you can see it in people's eyes and people's faces and even their body language. It'll just be, I'm done. I'm out. And I'm not cold. talking about it anymore. It's cold. It's very it? cold. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's it's demoralizing just, when you're on the other yes. end of that. It's quite demoralizing. Oh, you've got nowhere to go. You're just like, oh, I guess, I guess we're done with this conversation then mm -hmm. because there's nothing to respond against. You're bouncing against a stone wall. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so each of these, um, it, it is... It is terrible to get to them. However, I also want to normalise them because this can come from family of origin. This can be a normal way of working, that criticism or defensiveness is something that just is a part of what you do. And so if it is, if you're listening and it is a part of your relationship, please don't suddenly go, oh, my gosh, it's all over. No, yeah. no, no. The moment to listen and go, oh, it's a cue. It's a cue and a reminder for me to change and do something differently that's going to be healthier and more supportive for my relationship. Absolutely. And each one of these have got an antidote, as you suggested. And these antidotes are just a different way of working. So step one, identify for yourself, not your partner. Don't go telling your partner, I think you use contempt, right? No, just identify it's for you. you. Yes, taking responsibility. Exactly. Which which one am I, which would, oh, sorry, what's my go-to? Mm. And often one or two that are our classic go-to moves when we're in the midst of a really heightened conversation. Yeah. Once you know them, then you can start to explore the antidote. So the antidote for criticism is a gentle startup. So criticism is a harsh startup. It's beginning with blame. And the way we begin a conversation or a conflict indicates how it's going to end. If we start yelling, it's never going to work. It's all over from the get-go. You might as well waste your time. Whereas if you begin with a gentle startup and you frame it in terms of how you feel and what you need, all of a sudden your partner is able to listen. So instead of saying, you're so lazy, you left the socks on the floor, you instead go, hey, honey, uh, when you leave the socks on the floor, I feel really frustrated and a little disrespected because I've worked really hard to make this space clean and beautiful because I need a clean headspace for my week. Mm. And instead of me blaming, I'm just explaining what I need. Yes. And then they're able to take that on board. So the second one then, contempt. So contempt is where we're really putting down our partner, non-verbally or verbally. The flip side or the antidote to that is appreciating what is there. It's noticing the good and creating a culture of appreciation. And there is always something good, even when marriage is not going well. Like, thank you for doing the dishes. Thank you for taking yes. the garbage out. There's always something little that, and yes. it's, the challenge is to find it. Yep. But if you can start doing that, it has enormous power. Oh, Just, my... Sorry to throw you off course there, but you would know um, Dr. Emerson Egerich's. He's got that love and respect principle in marriage that he says, you know, the Bible talks about husbands love your wives. And then it says wives respect your husband. So it highlights there that for the husbands to love and cherish, maybe that's not instinctual. Maybe they actually have to learn that. And for women, well, I, I think men receive love through respect, women through cherishing. And so 
he talks about this crazy cycle that we can get on when women act disrespectfully men behave unlovingly and then you start spinning on this and it just spins into exactly what you're saying these four horsemen but there's a really easy way to reverse that and start spinning it back the other way and one of those ways is just through little words of appreciation that you can shift that needle and it just seems like a little bit but it actually goes a long way in relationship and relationship with men Uh, I think that is something they need. They need words of affirmation. They need to feel appreciated. And so if you want to shift that crazy cycle and start it spinning in what he calls the energizing cycle, it really is about that appreciation and that antidote to um, that you're talking about. Content, yes. And what we appreciate, appreciates. We see that again and again. I love that. So what it is that we offer thanks for, gratitude for, affirmation for, that will happen more. That will happen again and again because our partner wants to feel appreciated and loved and noticed and valued and seen and heard. So they will do that more in order to get that response. So that is incredibly valuable and incredibly purposeful if you're trying to move through content. Mm. In terms of defensiveness, where we're kind of like blocking it all, you can imagine we've got some little shields on our arms like, not taking it, it's not mine, no, it's yours. Yes. The opposite, the antidote to that is owning it. Mm-hmm. And you don't necessarily have to own all of it. So your partner might say all of this feedback to you and you might look at it and go, gosh, I actually don't agree with all of that. However, I can own this. I can see that 50% of this situation that we have arrived in is of my doing. I can see how my actions have contributed to how you are feeling now and I am sorry for that part of it. Yes. And so that's incredibly valuable. And then that last one there is stonewalling. And stonewalling really talks about flooding. That's what it is, which is a physiological response to an emotional experience. So it might look like sweaty palms or a racing heart or our mind goes blank or our legs just want to either be solidified to the ground or run away as fast as they can. Any of those responses are flooding, which is what we experience in stonewalling. And the antidote to that is self-soothing. So finding ways to calm our limbic system and remind ourselves that actually it's going to be fine. It's just conversation. We're going to survive this. We can get back into our frontal cortex. All is going to be well. And so we do that by doing some breathing. We can do some square breathing. We can do some journaling. We can go and take 20 minutes. It usually takes about 20 minutes for our our systems to come back on track and be ready for that conversation. But we have to be in charge and control. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so important. And I think when you see that visual, when you can see it like that and understand the dynamics that are happening, you're like, oh, okay, like we can work with this. So it doesn't oh, yes. have to be terminal, right? It does not have to be terminal, not at all. In fact, it can be wonderful. And it yes. can be wonderful just to watch the progression as you go and to look back and go, oh my gosh, look how far we've come in the last two months or six months. Gee, we've done well as a couple. Yes. Absolutely. And I think, sorry to interrupt you, Karen, but I think no, go for it. sometimes we've got to know it in our head first before we can action it. So we've got to understand the concepts and go, okay, I, I can see how it could work, even if I don't know how it will work for me just yet. Mm-hmm. And so giving that little bit of framework and information to begin with, that psychoeducation side of it is so important. And letting people know the information and evidence behind it is is just so valuable. It's such a great tool. Mm, It really is. Uh, Often when I'm walking with couples or, you know, women primarily come to me and sort of talk about their marriage and they're, he's this, he's this, he always, he never. And I was like, okay, you're criticising him. And there is something that he's doing legitimately that is hurtful, it's disrespectful, all of those things, it's unloving. But what I encourage women to do is to look for the complaint behind the criticism. Because, yes, the front, the front, what we're seeing is criticism, but there's something going on behind that criticism. So it's pausing and it's like, okay, what is the complaint behind the criticism? Because if you can have the humility to go there, then you have a chance of really turning your relationship around. So what is the complaint? What is what is he complaining about? She works too much or she's putting the kids first too much and you're neglectful or you're this. But what he's actually saying is I, I want to be connected to you and I'm feeling neglected at the moment. So it's like how can you then meet that need and we can get dig our heels in. We can be really stubborn. Oh, like, yeah. wow, he's behaved in all these ways and he does not deserve like my humility or me to be, why am I the one to make the first move? 
And we can stand proud and arrogant in that stance and we can have a marriage that ends up in ruins and divorce. So oh, yeah. it's, it's looking at the end goal, like, sure, do you want to be right or do you want to stay married? And it's working back from that point, what needs to happen in order. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I love that you talked about needs because we often find it really difficult to articulate what our needs or what our partner's needs are, especially mm. if that's not really part of the language of our relationship. And sometimes it just isn't. And so in order to get there, we need to look at emotions sometimes or the criticism or the complaint that's there in order to let it be a compass to point toward the need that is or isn't being met. Yes. So if I'm feeling cranky and exhausted and frustrated and mad, okay, all of those are really valuable emotions. You don't need to hide them. You don't need to squash them. Let's look at them. Let's look at them and go, okay, great. What fantastic information. Let's investigate. What are they pointing towards? What do you need? What is a need that is or isn't being met yet? Yes. And so in that moment, gosh, it might be rest. It might be time for connection with your partner. It might be just time away on your own. But let's investigate instead of pushing them away or assuming the worst. Let's assume the best and investigate. Absolutely. I think it's a lot of it it comes to mindset training too. Like, you know, that scripture saying, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. So I'm working through this um, process at the moment of becoming a mindset coach with Metanoia Catholic. And it's really beautiful, like going from the action and the result to the feeling, to the thought. And what are the facts here? And it's when yes. we're in relationship, this is so important. Like we have these surges of emotion and, and flooding is the technical word for it. But we have these surges and they make us and we, we lose our ability to think clearly and to separate facts and feelings and it all gets complicated. But having the ability and the skill to actually say, like you said, what are my needs? What am I feeling? Okay, what are the facts of this situation? Because if a husband is being really disrespectful or working too much, like what is his experience? What is his need as well as what is her need? And quite often it's not that he's intentionally being neglectful. He's feeling pressure too. So it's coming to that even or that middle ground where you can both recognize each other's needs, but that those needs can be communicated in a way that's not defensive, that's not critical, which is what you said. Like when you do this, I feel that's absolutely yeah. one of the most important communication skills. Definitely. And knowing that you're on the same team with this person. Yes. So you're working together with this person. So if one of you is out of kilter, if one of you is feeling like they are disconnected or unheard, your team is. And so you want to make sure your team is back on track. It's not against one another. We're not in comparison or in competition. We're actually in communion. So let's do that well together. And sometimes we need to lay down the thing that we've been carrying for a really long time. We need to put it down. So Marion Williamson has this beautiful quote, which is um, what I place on the altar becomes altered. And I think that that is just so valuable. At times we just lay it down and we go, do you know what? I've done all I can do. I give it to you and now I just have the conversation and I trust that this will go in the direction that is required. Mm, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's so many elements, aren't there? There's what we can do in the practical, but there's also the spiritual and sort mm. of praying into, I guess, take, for example, Megan, someone who is in a really difficult marriage. Like I, I think these principles work for the generally healthy marriage. There are situations and we do need to acknowledge that where there are addictions, there is abuse. Absolutely. And these principles are not for those situations. These Thank are you for, for the that. generally healthy marriage because I've seen a lot of women who's, well, a couple actually who I work with quite closely whose husbands were hooked on porn and really full on having multiple affairs. Like there's just a history of infidelity and priests telling her that she needs to pray more, she needs to do this more, or she should be available more, like <laughs> heaven forbid, uh, in that area. So there are situations where that's just not, the rules of a generally healthy relationship are not applicable in those situations and they need very different kind of counselling and intervention. You're absolutely correct, yeah. And in those moments, we've got to really look at safety, you know, as yes. our, our very first and foremost. So whether that's physical or emotional, safety needs to come as a priority. So in those moments, you would never tell a woman to please just be a little more humble 
and then mm-hmm. maybe it will become a more safe environment. No, oh my gosh, no, please don't. Please seek help. So make sure that your safety is there first. Mm-hmm. I think in those moments too, and we do this with couples, we'll refer an individual or both individuals to see individual psychologists as a part of this process because there's work that needs to be done on their own in order for this work as a couple to happen appropriately because couples therapy or couples counselling will not also double up as individual counselling. That's not the purpose or the process here. So if there is someone who is experiencing addiction, if there is someone who is recovering from trauma, if there is someone who is in the midst of a moment that is beyond them and their partner, they need to seek some individual specialist help first. Yeah, and it's so important. I know many years ago we were studying at the John Paul II Institute and this moral theologian said there's three questions we have to ask and answer in this order. Who am I? Where am I going? And then who will travel with me? And quite often people come into intimate relationships before they've asked and answered the question of who am, who am I and where am I going? And so the relationship is messy and it's chaotic because they haven't done that individual work. But it doesn't mean that you have to leave your marriage to do the individual work. You you see separate therapists and you can grow together. And remember someone asking me once, what is the key ingredient if I could nail it down to a successful marriage? And, And I'm interested in your thought. My thought was that it actually, it's not communication. It's not trust. It's not honesty. It's an openness and a receptivity to growth, to personal growth. I love it. Because if you're not taking responsibility for yourself, then you can't grow together as a couple. So I I don't know. I'm interested in your thoughts on that, your key ingredient, if you could. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Oh, I love what you just said. And I think that's of such value, gee, openness to learn and grow. I think for me, from what I've seen professionally, but also I've been with my husband now for 16 years, not as long as you and Jonathan, I don't think, but still a wonderful chunk of time. And for me, it's being heard. It really is as simple as that. It's being heard. And I think that when I work with couples, just the look of relief that comes over their face when their partner hears and paraphrases back what they've just heard and their partner goes, oh, my gosh, that's the first time I think you've ever got it. That's the first time he's ever heard or she has ever heard what it was that I was saying in that level. And it just suddenly means the walls come down and there's progress, there's movement, there's space for growth. Yes, because like you, I think you touched on this earlier, Jonathan often says that we have this deep need to be seen, known and loved. And I think yes. that's what you're saying. Yeah, it is. So Absolutely. Oh, Megan, that's that's a great conversation. We could go for hours. I know. Yeah, it's <laughs> lovely. Thanks so much. But thank you. Look, if people are wanting to get in touch with you in terms of getting personal or counselling for couple therapy or pre-marriage therapy, where do they find you? Yeah, sure. So they can find us online at lighthouserelationships.com.au. They can follow us on Instagram at lighthouse underscore relationships, or they can find us on Facebook at Lighthouse Relationships. Fantastic. I really do encourage you to check that out. There's some great posts that um, Megan posts on relationships, and these, again, can apply to all kinds of relationships. But thank you so much, Megan, for joining us today. It's such a such a gift. Lovely. Thanks so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation today on how to build and have healthy relationships, be that in the workplace, with our children or in our marriages. If you're in need of counselling or connection with a professional, I'd love to invite you to check out Megan's website, www.lighthouserelationships.com.au. They offer in-person counselling, but also virtually. So do check that out if you are in need of that personal targeted help in your relationships. If you like this content and you would like to go deeper, then I'd love to invite you to join us for our upcoming webinar on healthy relationships relationships and how to make marriage work. So often in life, we go into marriage and we put all of our effort into planning for the wedding day. But there's so much more that comes after that. And quite often, a couple of years into marriage, we run into troubled ground where that feeling of love wears off. And then we have to get about the task of actually building a relationship that's going to see us through a lifetime. So I'd love to invite you to join me. I am going to host this webinar on the principles for making marriage work. So this is for anyone who is married, anyone who is dating, even if you're single and you'd like some insights into marriage and some dynamics and tools and strategies on how to have a healthy marriage. 
I'd love you to join us. Until next week, ladies, have a beautiful week and God bless you.